Good morning. Good morning, Oasis. This morning, we're going to be te teaching out of Malachi again. And we're doing the second chapter, uh, verses 1 through 9. You know, as I prepared for this, the one thing that I was trying to figure out how to talk about that I felt the Holy Spirit's leading was how, when we read this set of verses and, and what, what's going on, which is basically the priests are being rebuked for what they have done and what they've allowed. If you remember last week in Deuteronomy 15, 21, it was very clear uh, what God's guidance was concerning uh, sacrifices, and yet there they were. And so I fast forward to today and the message and how, how do we get to the point where they were or have we? So that's a question. Have we allowed acceptable sins to drift into church? One thing that should be clear up front in this message is this isn't a seeker-friendly message. This is for Oasis. This is for people in this church who confess to know Jesus Christ. Just so there's no confusion. But let me give you some examples of things that have crept in that we don't think a whole lot of but yet we know we have very clear guidance on. Here's the first one. How about debt? Is debt sinful? Can be, right? Enough debt can change the course of our lives and how we do things, right? That's a problem. How about drunkenness? We have clear guidance on whether or not it's okay. And I'm not, trying, I'm not talking about being legalistic and saying you can't have alcohol. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about drunkenness. There's a big difference. Here's my favorite. Gluttony. That's my kryptonite. All right, something I've been battling my whole life. And of course, when you prepare for a message, you have to deal with the junk in your life. And that's one of my... My baggage is, is gluttony. I want to give you an overview of where we've been, where we are now, where we're going with, with Malachi, and then we're going to get into the text, the passage. So here it is. We're about a quarter of the way through Malachi. Uh, we can see a pattern within this book. We see a prophet whose name is Malachi, which means my messenger. He's warning God's people. That's us. We are God's people to be on the lookout for certain things. What are those things? He starts out by explaining his love for his people. Then he proceeds to rebuke the priests for allowing polluted offerings, which for our passage today is kind of going back to the first, uh, what we talked about last week. And then he talks about Judah profaning their covenant by marrying outsiders or foreigners. Again, that's clearly told, they're told not to. And in chapter three, we judge those who have strayed and don't fear him. And then further on in chapter three, Malachi addresses those who cheat God in their giving. I'll be preaching about that in a few more weeks. In the end of the book, we hear about a book of remembrance and the great day of the Lord. These are predictions concerning end times. And we conclude Malachi in the end of May. And we're going to spend the summer exploring some select psalms. I'm excited to see what that looks like for us. But if you're willing and able, uh, let's stand in honor of God's word as we read it. We're going to be in Malachi, the second chapter, the first nine verses. And now, this admonition is for you, O priests. 
If you do not listen, and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I'm going to send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've already cursed them, because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread on your faces the offal from your festival sacrifices. And just so you, if you're wondering what that is, that's the innards, that's the guts of an animal. And you'll know that I have sent you this admonition so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace. And I gave them to him this call for reverence. And he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instructions were on his, was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. For the lips of the priest, for the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, and from his mouth men should seek instruction, because he is the messenger of the Lord. Almighty. But you have turned from your way, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people, because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in manners, matters of the law. You may be seated. So, as I read through this passage, the first thing that came to my mind was, it's talking about priests. And the first question I had was, we need to nail down, do we have priests today? Because that's kind of key to this whole passage making sense to us. I found uh, an explanation for it that I want to read to you. I usually do that when it says something better than I can say myself. Um, I found this in uh, gotquestions.org. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. But it's going to explain that we no longer have priests in an Old Testament sense, but we are all priests now from a New Testament sense. So that resource, by the way, uh, gotquestions.org, is a great reference to use. Here's what it said. It says, Old Testament priests were chosen by God. They were not self-appointed, and they were chosen for a purpose to serve God with their lives by offering up sacrifices. The priesthood served as a picture or type of the coming ministry of Jesus Christ, a picture that was no longer needed once his sacrifice on the cross was completed. When the thick temple veil that covered the doorway to the Holy of Holies was torn in two by God at the time of Christ's death, small little detail from the top to the bottom, and it's in Matthew 27, 51, it says, God was indicating that the Old Testament priesthood was no longer necessary. Now people could come directly to God through the great high priest, Jesus Christ. And that's from Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. There are now no earthly mediators between God and man, as existed in the Old Testament priesthood. And that comes from 1 Timothy 2.5. Now, let's go to uh, 1 Peter and see what it says. It says, you are a chosen people. It says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had received mercy, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now there's, there's other places we could go uh, to validate the claim of priesthood of all believers. There are some verses in uh, Hebrews, uh, but the bottom line is, 
We are. And it's hard for us to understand that, I think, at times. And it's not a matter of clergy, laity. It's that we've all been given this power. Where does that power come from? It comes from the fact that when we receive Christ, we got the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, what does that look like to be a priest currently? Well, he doesn't have to wear a collar, right? You look around you, those are your, your priests in this room. But what do we do with that? What do we do with the fact that we are? And how do we take what Malachi said as a rebuke and have it make sense to us today? We have to know God's truth. And how do we know God's truth? Well, we can study or we can know, but what's the difference? And is there a difference? I could put a shameless plug in about how we would like to do another Bible study on how to study the Bible, but it's not about intellectual knowledge, right? It's how we live this out. And that's what we're gonna talk about more in, in, in the future of this message. But how do we know God's truth? What things do we do? What are we told to do in our discipleship process that will help us know God's truth? How about devotional time? Do we have one? Are we encouraging other people to experience that? You know, some churches, it's about, and I'm not saying this is Oasis, I'm saying in previous churches we've been in, some of the, some of the emphasis is on go to Lifeway, well, let's get the latest and greatest Bible study that's out, and then we're going to do discipleship. Is that really discipleship? Probably not. Not really. So there's a, there's a difference between knowing and learning and studying but are we giving God our best when we do that devotional time? Or is it an afterthought? That's a question for you to think about. So the guidance for uh, sacrificing animals was pretty clear. And this was a repeat from last week of uh, Deuteronomy 15, 21. It says, if an animal has a defect, is lame or blind, or has any serious flaw, you must not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. Now, is that vague? Is that pretty precise in its guidance? But yet, we've, we find that this has become normal to take the cross-eyed lamb or the broken leg, Right? It's okay to laugh, right? <laughs> All right, so the guidance is clear, but yet we get to this point where that became normal. And all I'm saying is, what, what are we experiencing present day that parallels that? In our small group, our home church, do we? Because I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just saying, is that what we're doing? Are we allowing that to happen? It's a slow creep to where we can have debt, drunkenness, or gluttony, and, and not talk about it. Just, eh, it's accepted. Eh, I'm not going to talk about that. I don't want to offend anybody. We're, we're in that world where uh, the culture's virtue is tolerance. It trumps love. But what, what's, as a Christian, what should be my highest virtue? Let's see over here. Hello? What would you say? Make a guess. Love. Right. But does culture do that? Does culture say love is the highest? I think that the culture's highest priority is tolerance. That's how we get into some of the conversations that we have regarding some subjects that we know are sinful, but we're not going to talk about. Them. So this slide is up here when uh, my wife and I went to seminary that was the the motto for that for that school and when you first get there you're seated around campus and you're like hmm teach truth love well that's that's good that's catchy but what's the reason what's the rationale for that motto it's to learn how to do that while you're in this school right 
because we're going to learn a lot about how to teach truth at that seminary, but they don't really teach us how to love well in seminary, right? It's more about give you data, become the, the theological expert, all right? And the reality is, if you are teaching truth without love, you're not teaching truth. You've got to have love with it. Have to. And it's not easy. My wife can attest to that. <clears throat> but bottom line is that we have to do things in love. I have to keep that in mind. You know, there's an old famous Bible verse that says, God helps those who help themselves. You know, the one that's in 2 Corinthians. Man, it's a tough crowd. Whew. <laughs> anyway, that God helps those who help themselves is, uh, it's got its own wiki website with theological verses that back up the fact that, yes, this is biblical. But the reality is, no, it's not. But we hear people use that phrase all the time as if it is a validated verse out of the Bible. So when we talk about teaching truth, or how to know God's truth, we have to be able to employ things and tools that are gonna help us in, in discerning that process. And so far, what have we covered? Well, we talked about priests and we said we have to know God's truth and we have to be able to combine teaching truth and loving well. The two go together and it can be hard to do, which leads us to the next thing. We have to live God's truth. And I have an example of that. I have actually two examples. Um, the first one, I have to tell you up front, I got permission from my wife. My wife actually provided me with this example, illustration. And it was uh, a long time ago, back when we had phones that looked like this. We actually had landlines in our homes in the you called home numbers. I know that's kind of a novelty now. Um, but nonetheless, we had that. And the story was that we, you also, on some of the fancy phones, had a caller ID. So you knew who was calling you. And let's just say, theoretically, that somebody's calling you that you don't really want to talk to. And then you have a nice, innocent six-year-old girl that you say, hey, I'll tell you what I want you to do. This is, this is Jennifer saying this to my daughter. I want you to answer the phone and tell whoever's calling, which we probably knew who it was, right? And that's probably why we did this. Uh, we're not here, right? So that's the story, right? Now, is that an example of how we're living out God's truth? Probably not, right? Probably not a good, good example. How about the, here's a, here's a self, uh, given a, a great example, of course myself, would be this, this one. So when, that's the wad of cash example. In preparation for messages that are, that are done here at Oasis, um, when you're doing that preparation, you have to self-reflect, which is not one of my strong points. But when I'm reading like the next message on, in chapter three about giving, and it's talking about, uh, hey, test me in this and know whether this is true. And it's distorted and misused sometimes by preachers who are trying to gather money. But the bottom line was, are you giving in a New Testament way, which is different from the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament, basically, if you added up all their tithes, it was almost 30%, right? And we're not talking about that. The primary, primary guidance we probably have in, in the New Testament is gonna be to do what? To have a cheerful heart, right? To not give under compulsion, meaning don't do it just because, well, I gotta give 10%, therefore, right? That's not what they're talking about. So, in my introspective evaluation of my giving, uh, I realized that I had gotten lazy and I had not 
kept up with our giving, and so I needed to fix that. So I did. And my point in that is not only just to say, ooh, wow, look, look at Kevin, is uh, that that's an example, though, of doing it correctly, right? Take God's word, apply it to our lives, and make the adjustments. Uh, Howard Hendricks said in his How to Study the Bible series, he said a lot of things that stuck out, but one of the things he said that I'll never forget was why he would ask the people he was teaching, why, are you, why do you read the Bible? What's the purpose? What, what's the point of reading the Bible? And his theme was, if you're not reading the Bible to be transformed by it, you have the wrong motive. That's the reason you're reading it. It's, it's a relationship, right? It's not a religion, all right? And, and that's where sometimes we cross, cross paths incorrectly. Now, we have to share God's truth by our actions. We talked about actions. Is my walk and my talk in alignment? We, we hear that phrase in Christian, uh, Christian circles, is my walk and my talk in alignment? What do I mean by that? That means if I'm doing things that are directly against God's word, then that's a miscompare. That's something that doesn't add up, right? And so I don't want to do that. That's, that's affecting my witness with other people. Um, so one of the ways that we can do things is by witnessing to those around us. And this is a quote that most people attribute to St. Francis of Assisi, but of course it's controversial whether or not he actually said it. But for the purposes of my message, it fits very well. So, let's read it. It says, do all you can to preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. What does that mean? Live it out, that's right. Live it out. And, and, and oh, by the way, if you're not letting your walk and your talk be in alignment, you're going to get called out on it by some people, I guarantee you. So remember that. Um, we have to share God's truth by our words. Here's the real tragedy in this passage. The priests knew the truth. Um, you could have this conversation about how the people in that day might not have had access. They didn't have Bibles. They didn't have a stack of Bibles in their living room. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have commentaries, right? But the priests, they did know, right? And yet, they allowed this stuff to happen. I want to read uh, verses 8 and 9 just to reemphasize what, the, what was the consequence here. It says, but you... You have turned from, your, from the way, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before how many? All the people. Because you have not followed my ways, You've, but you have shown partialities in matter of the law. When, when they say partiality in matters of the law, that means I pick and choose. Right? Oh, I think this one's a good one. Let's go with that. I'll enforce that one. But then, eh, well, not so much on that one. So that's the danger we run into. And, and we've talked recently up here about because we're in a time of grace as believers, it can easily turn into what I like to call the credit card syndrome, where I do something I know I shouldn't do, but because I'm a Christian, I'm going to get forgi forgiven for it, right? And it's like, here, let me pay for that. Nope. I'll just, I'll just go back and say, forgive me. And is that what we're supposed to do? Does that sound proper? Does that sound like good theology? Good working out our Christian in the, in the world? Probably not. Okay. <clears throat> the, back in the 2000 time frame, early 2000s, this was a book that came out. It was by William Fay. And it was a way to get people to witness to other people about their faith. And it gave a process, used these verses. There were all kinds of different ones back in that time frame of 
here's a good methodology on how to share your faith with other people. But the biggest takeaway from that program, I call it a program, was you don't have to worry about the results. And it was like, whew, okay. And that was a big relief. That was kind of the, the, the big idea of the book was you can share Jesus with other people and if they don't immediately fall on their knees and accept Christ in that moment, it's okay, right? And oh, by the way, the reason we're sharing it is not so we can be theologically perfect in our explanation. We're just sharing what's going on in our lives. And when we do that, how does that get refuted? Does that make sense? Are you, you following me? Okay. So that was a big, that was a big deal. But that sharing process goes back to our actions and our words and how we're living because people are watching. They're watching us. Um, the other one was, or, actually, let's not do that one yet. <laughs> um, I want to I talk about withholding the truth. And I want to I wanna ask you, let me just, I'll go ahead and do it. How are you withholding the truth? So that's a question for everybody here. Now, everybody here who professes Christ. Remember I said that at the beginning, all right? So when I say you, I mean you and you and you and you, all right? I know I'm trying to make it personal. And, I'm, and I, I, wanna, I want to be specific that we're talking about us, us as believers. It's all of us that claim the name of Christ. And that's who we're talking to. In the Old Testament, everything was physical. They literally slaughtered a lamb. They literally parted the sea for them to walk through. They uh, literally... Uh, did that slaughtering of a lamb as, as an act of atonement. But we're told in the New Testament the cross was a one-time-for-all act that literally happened. But it opened up a new age. And that age is where things occur spiritually, as well as physically, but far more spiritually. When I received Christ, what did I simultaneously receive? The Holy Spirit. That person in me is my guarantee of my salvation, not my feelings. And my feelings sometimes change. They can come and go. But his word is going to tell me that I am assured of that. Let me read to you some words out of the Bible. If you ever were worried about whether you were assured of your salvation, it's in 1 John. It's in the fifth chapter. I'm going to read these backwards. So I'm going to do the 13th verse first, and then I'm going to do 11 and 12, because it'll make sense when we do it in that order. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Well, what things is he talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. And who, he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So it's not a feeling. Those aren't reliable. What I want you to realize, Oasis, is that we honor God, we can honor God by understanding that we're all priests, that we have to know God's truth, and that we have to live God's truth and that we have to share God's truth by our actions and our words. And ultimately, we honor God by teaching what is true. Okay. Let me pray. Father, Abba, thank you. Thank you for bringing us all here this morning. Thank you for giving us your word in Malachi that talks about priests. 
which can seem so disconnected from our real world now. But Father, help us to understand we are priests in this world as representatives of Jesus Christ and that you walk within us and among us as we share our lives through our word and our actions and how we live. Help us, Father, to come away from this message transformed by your word. Help us, Lord, to not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.